glory of Asia, city of Thebes. It was from you that I, Andromache, once came dowered with golden luxury to the royal house of Priam, given to Hector as lawful wife for the bearing of his children. In days gone by, I was a woman to be envied, but now I am, if any woman ever was, the paragon of misery. I saw my husband Hector killed by the hand of Achilles, and I beheld Astyanax, the son I bore my husband, hurled from the high battlements once the Greeks had captured the land of Troy. I myself, a member of a house most free, became slave and was brought to Greece, given as the choices of the Trojan spoil to the islander Neoptolemus as his prize of war. I live now in the lands that border on Phythia, here in the city of Pharsalia, lands where the sea goddess Thetis, far from the haunts of men and fleeing their company, dwelt as wife with Peleus. The people of Thessaly call it Thetidaeon, in honor of the goddess's marriage. Here is where Achilles' son made his home and he lets Peleus rule over the land of Pharsalia, being unwilling to take the scepter during the old man's lifetime. In this house, I have given birth to a man-child, lying with Achilles' son, my master. Formerly, though I was sunk in misfortune, the hope always drew me to him that if the child lived, my family would find some kind of help and defense. But ever since Neoptolemus married Hermione, spurning my bed since he was master and I a slave, I have been hounded with cruel ill treatment by her. For she says that with secret poisons, I make her childless and an object of hatred to her husband. And that I wish to take her place in the house, casting her marriage bed out by violent means. This bed I received unwillingly to begin with and now I have relinquished it. Great Zeus, be my witness that it was against my will that I became sharer in this bed. But I cannot persuade her of this, and she wants to kill me. Menelaus, her father, is acting as his daughter's accomplice in this, and he is now in the house, having come from Sparta from this, for this very purpose. In fear, I have come and taken my seat at this shrine. This shrine, in fear, I have come and taken my seat at this shrine of Thetis near the house on the chance that it may save me from death. For Peleus and Peleus's offspring honor it as a monument to their marriage tie with the Nereid. My only child have I sent secretly to another house for fear that he may be killed for his father is not beside me to protect me, and for his son he does not exist, since he is away in the land of Delphi. There he is offering amends to Apollo for his madness, in which he went to Pytho and asked Phoebus for satisfaction for his father Achilles, whom the god had killed, on the chance that by begging remission of punishment for his previous sins, he might win the god's favor for the future. Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy, Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen. I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies and with the uh, Out of Chaos Theater. Um, and today we bring you Euripides' play Andromache. And I wanna start by warning uh, the audience just a bit uh, about the content of the play. Um, there's a bit about uh, sexual assault and violence um, and the plight of women in the ancient world. Um, so for some more sensitive viewers, uh, these topics uh, may not be appropriate. Now, um, I'm here today with another excellent cast of actors. Uh, we have Tamika Ch Chavis, whom you just saw, uh, Michael Lumsden, Evelyn Miller, uh, Paulo Mahoney, Brian Nelson, Sarah Valentine, and Nori Victoria. Um, and we're joined today um, by Katerina Ladianu, um, who's an expert in Greek tragedy and will have some great things to tell us about this play. But first, 
let's see where we are with this performance. Um, so this isn't Euripides' first play which features Andromache. Her suffering and the death of her child as Dionyx are also central to Trojan women, a group Euripides returns to again in his Hecuba and his Helen. Here we find Andromache, years after the end of Troy, with a new child with Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. The play's date of performance is unknown, with scholars placing it as early as 428 at the end of the Periclean Plague, or as late as 417 BCE. And its treatment of women, children, and the offspring of slaves may reflect on the use of Athenian power during its empire, and perhaps may comment on the, on the Mytilenean revolt, um, when an allied city tried to rebel from Athenian power and was voted to have all of its men executed and its women and children enslaved after its surrender. Now this decision was reversed, but it bared the nature of Athenian rule and foreshadowed the demise of Milos 10 years later. So I wonder if we can read this play today without thinking of our own use of power and our treatment of refugees. This play is in part about who counts in the face of power and how adjacency to strength defines whose humanity matters. Can we read it in the modern day without thinking about the blood on our collective hands? And how did the audiences think about it? So Katerina, I'm, I'm really happy to have you to talk about this play. So could you start by, by situating it for me and where you think it is in Euripides' work and why is this important play? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, here you, with you all. Um, as you already say, um, Andromache is situated in, in the whole uh, team of kind of, of plays that ha have to do with the aftermath of the Trojan War. And uh, the Andromache, I believe, uh, reflects uh, in a really unique way on the experience of captured women uh, who are made slaves by the defeat uh, of their people. Uh, as uh, happens in Hecuba and the women in Troy, uh, which are the most uh, striking parallels to the same theme. Uh, while the uh, women in Troy dramatizes the immediate uh, aftermath of the war against um, um, uh, in Troy, the Andromache focuses uh, on the later and separate stage of, of this process of conquest. Uh, a conquest which is, and this is really important, I believe, both um, military but also sexual. Uh, the experience of Andromache is very central uh, to, to this play. Uh, and it is um, a play in which uh, mourning but also resilience uh, is very important. Um, Andromache, as we will see, is wrestling uh, with slavery. Um, but she's also wrestling with her past. Um, and her Trojan past is something we know both from Homer and Euripides. And the Athenians, both the Athenians and we today are very familiar with it. Um, another thing uh, is uh, that the marriage of um, Neoptolemus and Hermione is in the center uh, of this play, and it, it is very connected with the relationship um, of Andromache to Hermione and Neoptolemus, because she is kind of in the middle of the situation as the, a concubine. Um, I believe that it's very uh, central to see the play's exploration of the experience of women. And I think the play uh, focuses on such an experience uh, as it focuses both on uh, the institution, let's say, uh, of concubines and the idea of fertility. Both ideas are linked uh, to the concerns of the polis, the concerns of Athens with legitimacy. And they are defined uh, as legitimacy is defined by uh, birth from both citizen parents. And this is something that the play uh, explores. I think Euripides uh, saw this, uh, the connection between the problem of legitimacy and the role of women as the, uh, the ones who preserve uh, the oikos. And uh, I think uh, we can um, start thinking uh, of this play as a play of legitimacy uh, as well as all interesting things you already said. So that helps to explain in part mm -hmm. the sort of central focus on mm -hmm. 
um, the, on the child who goes unnamed. Mm -hmm. uh, but so can, before we get to the next scene, can you explain a little bit what's going on physically here for audiences who might not be familiar mm -hmm. with the myth? So she's inside this shrine to Thetis, Achilles' mother. Um, what's she doing there and what's the ritual significance of it? Um, uh, I, I think the other uh, focus uh, in, in Andromache is the focus on gods, uh, what uh, gods are doing in, the, in this weird uh, world uh, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of, of Troy. And uh, I think uh, Euripides plays it uh, beautifully by situating the play uh, close to a shrine. And we have to imagine Thetis uh, sitting close or kneeling uh, close to um, the, the statue of Thetis, uh, who is also a character in the play. But in the beginning, as the uh, scene opens, let's see, uh, we see Andromache kneeling on the statue of, uh, of Thetis. She's a suppliant, so she is um, begging um, uh, the goddess to save her. And uh, this is in, in the context of, of a shrine as well. So we we'll probably have some kind of temple, some kind of building, um, a religious building, and then the statue is probably situated outside this um, enclosure, if, if not a building. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and you spoiled the end for everybody. Now they know that there's a god coming. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Right. Um, and at, maybe in the end we can talk about how, whether or not it was a surprise to the audience because it's kind yes. of a Euripidean thing to do. Uh, so after Andromache speaks at the beginning, um, a servant enters and tells her that Hermione and Menelaus are arriving, planning to kill her son. She's waiting for Peleus to come too. Once the servant arrives, Andromache laments her many fortunes and is joined by the women of Thea, and then Hermione enters. The finery of luxurious gold I have about my head and this variegated cloth I wear in my body. I did not wear these on my arrival here as the first fruits of the house of Achilles or of Peleus, but my father, Menelaus, gave them to me from the city of Sparta, together with a large dowry, and therefore I may speak my mind. Though you are a slave woman, one by the spear, you mean to throw me out of this house and take possession of it. Because of your poisons, I am hated by my husband, and my womb is perishing unfruitful because of you. The minds of Asian women are clever at such things. But I shall stop you from carrying out this plan, and the temple of the Nereid here will not profit you at all, nor its altar or its sanctuary but you will be put to death. If some god or mortal means to save your life, you must cease from these rich, proud thoughts you once had and cower in humility. Fall at my feet and sweep my house, scattering Achilles' water by hand from my gold-wrought vessels, and know where in the world it is you live. There is no Hector here, no Priam and his gold, but this is a Greek city. But you, wretched woman, are so gone in folly that you bring yourself to sleep with the man, to sleep with the son of the man who killed your husband, and to bear children from those who are murderers of your kin. This is the way all barbarians are. Father lies with daughter and son with mother, brother with sister, nearest kin murder each other, and there is no law to stop any of this. Do not introduce such customs into our city, for it is also not right for one man to be in charge of two women. Rather, everyone who wants to live without pain is content to look to a single mate for his bed. The mind of a woman is a jealous thing and always ill-disposed towards rivals in love. Oh, my. The young are a great bane among the mortals. And within that class, those of mortals 
who practice injustice. I'm afraid that my being your slave will prevent me from speaking, even though my case is strong. Afraid that if I win the argument, I may for that very reason suffer harm. For those whose pride and position are great do not take kindly to hearing from their inferior arguments that defeat them. Nonetheless, I shall not be guilty of betraying myself. Tell me, young woman, what was the reliable argument that persuaded me to provide that to deprive you of your lawful due as a wife? Is it that Sparta is a lesser city than Troy and is surpassed in fortune by it and that you see me as a free woman? Was it in order that I might bear children instead of you, slaves and a miserable appendage to myself? Or is it that emboldened by youth and a body in the bloom of its prime, by the greatness of my city and by friends, I mean to possess your house instead of you? Or will my people put up with my children as the royal family of Phythia if you do not bear any? Naturally, since the Greeks love me both for Hector's sake and for the sake of Paris, who is their relative by marriage as well as mine. And am I myself obscure and not rather one of Troy's royal family? No, it is not because of any drugs of mine that your husband dislikes you, but the fact that you are not fit to live. You are not fit to live with, for this too is a means of procuring love. It is not beauty, but good qualities that give joy to husbands. But if you get angry, then Sparta is a great city, while Skiros, you maintain, is nowhere. You are a rich woman living in the midst of the poor, and Menelaus, you claim, is a greater man than Achilles. It is for this, that your husband hates you. A woman, even if given in marriage to a lowly husband, must respect him and not engage in a contest of pride. If you had had a husband, a king in snowy Thrace, where one husband divides his bed in turn among many women, would you have killed them? If so, you would have clearly branded all women with the charge of sexual insatiability. This is a shameful thing. And yet though we women suffer worse from this disease than men do, at least let us veil it decently from sight. Dearest Hector, I even went so far as to help you in your armors. If Aphrodite ever made you fall and I often gave the breast to your bastards in order that I might show you no bitterness, by doing this, I won my husband over with my goodness. But you, in fear, but you, in your fear, will not let so much as a drop of water from the open sky fall on your husband. Do not seek to surpass your mother in her man-loving ways, woman. All those who have sinned must avoid the character of their bad mothers. Lady, to the extent that you are able to, without vexation, to that extent be ruled by me and come to some agreement with her words. Why do you take this high and lofty tone and enter into a contest of words with me, maintaining that you are chaste while I am not? Is it not because of the very arguments on which you take your stand? May your way of thought never come to dwell with me, woman. You are young, and you speak of shameful things. You do not speak them, but do them against me with all your might. Will you not suffer your marital troubles in silence? What, is this not the first interest of women everywhere? Yes, for those who make the proper use of it. Otherwise, it is not proper. We do not live here with barbarian customs. What's shameful is shameful, here as well as there. You're clever. Clever? 
yeah, you have to die. Do you see Thetis's image looking at you? Yes, hating your country for the death of Achilles. Helen ruined her, not I. It was your mother. So you go on alluding to my woes. I'm silent and hold my tongue just as you wish. Say now the words I came to you to hear. I say you do not have the sense you ought. This sacred shrine of the Nereid, will you lead it? If promised, I'll not be killed. Otherwise, never. My mind is fixed. I shall not wait for my husband. But neither will I surrender before he comes. I'll set you on fire, paying your state no heed. Burn on. The gods will know who is to blame. I'll cut your flesh with dread and painful wounds. Bloody the goddess's altar. She'll pursue you. Oh, barbarian creature. Bold as brass, do you hold out against your death? Yet soon, without force, I shall raise you from this seat. Such is the lure I possess to entice you, but I will say no more. The event will soon make all plain. Sit on, for even if molten lead all about you should hold you fast, I shall make you get up before Achilles' son comes in whom you trust. Yes, in him I trust. It is monstrous that while some god has given us a cure for the bites of the snakes of the wild, no one has yet found the specific against a woman, a bad one, such a bane we are to mankind. So that scene is pretty riveting because it's one of the few in extant Greek tragedy where you really have uh, two women characters engaged in the sort of competitive speech making. But it's also filled um, with some fascinating themes um, that are, are really hard to unpack. I mean, uh, Katerina, we could probably spend a few hours now just talking about that exchange. Uh, but but let, let's do a couple things. Let's start with a simple thing and then move to something a little more complex um, just to sort of flesh this out. Um, can you, can you uh, explain who Hermione is and why she's married to Neoptolemus? I think for some viewers, um, the mythography in the background uh, might be a little confusing. Oh, okay. Uh, so Hermione is, I uh, suppose, I mean, in, in mythology, she is uh, the daughter of Menelaus, who is the king of Sparta, uh, who went to Troy with the other crowd of the Achaeans, uh, with the best of Achaeans, uh, to, um, to take uh, Helen back, because uh, Helen um, and uh, uh, Paris uh, went went to Troy. Uh, so now, uh, of course, uh, Helen is back uh, with uh, Menelaus, and uh, their daughter Hermione uh, was married to Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles. Um, uh, Neoptolemus has uh, is in Delphi uh, right now, so this is why uh, he doesn't appear uh, on stage uh, up to this point. Uh, at least. <laughs> so, we're, so, and it's a weird, I've always, it's always struck me as a weird way to sort of reconcile the Atreids and the family of Achilles <laughs> to sort of have this marriage at the end. And in a way it may echo the promised and unfulfilled marriage of Achilles and Iphigenia, one of the right. other daughters. Um, but what are we to make of the themes of nativism and legitimacy and barbarism that come up in this, in this segment? Right? Because she's not a native of the city, by that I mean Hermione, but she's constantly emphasizing the otherness of um, Andromache and making some woody, pretty wild claims about the customs of the Trojans. How would have this read to ancient audiences? Right. Uh, uh, before going to that, another thing that is, uh, I think, important for me uh, is, although she is uh, in, in the family of Neoptolemus and she lives in Thea right now, she doesn't seem to be very integrated uh, in her new family. 
Um, uh, on the other hand, she seems to be um, focusing on her Spartan past and uh, seemed to be very closely connected with her father uh, and her family in Sparta. And I think this is uh, going to be important um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the next scenes uh, as well. Um, as far as, as Andromache goes, uh, I think that this dialogue uh, very well uh, is, is very well used to reflect uh, uh, on the main concerns of women's experience. And of course, um, uh, one of, of the biggest um, events uh, in a woman's um, life uh, in um, in fifth century Athens, at least, uh, or, or um, ancient Greece, uh, generally, is marriage and motherhood. And those are uh, the, the things that concern uh, Andromache and Hermione uh, a lot. And this is the main, uh, the, the main problem uh, for Hermione. She cannot have a child. She doesn't have a child uh, yet, at least. And she blames uh, Andromache for that. Um, and uh, of course, the other, her problem, her other problem is that Andromache does have uh, a child uh, with Neoptolemus, a child uh, that is illegitimate though. So, mm -hmm. so, th so and th this navigates much of the strange territory that you get um, with Greek uh, myth and legitimacy. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of the language that comes the, here, though, she, she talks about um, Andromache being, you know, this Eastern, this Asian woman who uses magic and drugs. And then she talks about their, their incest. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of material in, in there that you don't really find in Homer or other places. So it's really, this is really a fifth century text. In a way, some of that language reminds me of Medea. Um, but we can That's talk true, true, more about true. that. Um, in, in the next scene break. Um, mm -hmm. So the chorus sings when Andromache leaves and it reflects on the destruction of the whole Trojan War, uh, tracing it back to Paris. And there's this sort of uh, obsession about what could have we done to have avoided the suffering. And then of a sudden Menelaus enters. So we're getting sort of the, uh, the who's who of, of maybe anti-heroes. And he is holding Andromache's son promising to kill him unless she gives up the altar to Thetis. She doubts, Andromache doubts that he'll actually keep his word and let the boy go and laments her terrible choice. Uh, she doesn't, you know, her life or her son's. Um, and she leaves the sanctuary to embrace him. Menelaus has her seized and tells her that he'll let Hermione decide whether or not to kill the boy. She curses the city as she leaves. The chorus sings of the dangers of plural marriage and the boy appears on stage with his mother. Hermione has decided that he will die with her. The boy kneels before Menelaus, begging him. And then Peleus appears to witness this scene. But look, I see Peleus nearby hastening his aged steps hither. Women, I ask you, and I ask him that oversees this sacrifice, what is going on? How has it come about? What is the cause of the house's disease? What are you doing plotting death without trial? Menelaus, stop. Do not hasten an injustice. Lead me on more quickly, for this is not, I think, the task of a leisured moment, but rather it is time now more than ever to recover the strength of my youth. First I shall blow a favouring breeze on this woman's sails. Tell me, on what charge do these men bind your hands fast with a noose and lead you and the boy off? For you are being done to death like some you with her lamb, while I and your master are away. These men, old sir, are leading me off to die with my son, just as you see. What shall I say to you? I have sent you not one, but countless fervent messages, 
but you doubtless know by report of the strife in the house I have had with this man's daughter and why I am being killed. Now they are taking me away and have dragged me off from the altar of Thetis, who bore you, your noble son, and whom you hold in reverence. They did not try me on any charge or wait for those who are absent from the house, but have acted because they knew my weakness and that of this child here, whom they are about to kill, guiltless though he is, along with his unhappy mother, but I entreat you, old sir, falling before your knees, for I cannot touch your beloved chin with my hand. Save me in the God's name, otherwise I shall die, sir, with disgrace to you and a misery for me. I order you to loosen her bonds before someone smarts for it and to release this woman's two hands. But I forbid it. And I am in no other ways not inferior to you and have much more authority over her. What? Will you come here and manage my household? Is it not enough to control affairs in Sparta? It was I who took her captive from Troy. But my grandson received her as his prize of valor. And not my goods all his? And here's all mine? Yes. To treat well, not ill, not to kill by the sword. Never. Be sure. Will you take her hand from my hand? But I shall when I have blooded your head with this scepter. You will find out if you come closer and touch me. What? Can you belong with the men, you utter coward? How do you merit inclusion among the men? You lost your wife to a Phrygian by leaving your house unguarded, believing you had a chaste wife in your house when in fact she was an utter whore. Not even if she wanted to could a Spartan woman be chaste. They leave their houses in the company of young men, thighs showing bare through their revealing garments. And in a manner I cannot endure, they share the same running tracks and wrestling places. After that, should we be surprised if you do not train up women who are chaste? You should ask Helen this question, seeing that she left behind Zeus of the kindred in your house and went off on a revel with a young man to another country. Was it for her sake then that you led such a great throng to Troy? You ought to have spat her away and not moved a single spear once you had discovered her treachery, should have let her stay in Troy and never taken her back into your house, should have paid her a wage to stay away. But your mind did not sail in this direction. Rather, you lost lives, many and brave, and left old women at home bereft of their sons and robbed gray-headed fathers of their noble children. Of these, I, unlucky man, am one. And I look on you as murderer of Achilles, as if you were some kind of defiler. You alone came back from Troy unwounded. And your fine armour in its fine case you took to Troy and brought back in the same condition. I said to, Neoptolo to Neoptolemus when he was about to marry that he ought not to contract a marriage alliance with you or take into his house the foal of such a base mother. For such daughters reproduce their mother's faults. Take heed, ye suitors, to get the daughter of a good mother. Furthermore, what an outrage you committed against your brother, ordering him to kill his daughter most foolishly. Were you so in fear that you might not have a worthless wife? And when you had taken Troy, for I shall go there also in my argument, you did not kill your wife when you had her in your power, but when you saw her breasts, you threw away your sword and kissed and fawned on the betraying bitch, proving no match, coward that you are, for Aphrodite's power. On top of this, you come into the house of my grandson and plunder it in his absence and attempt to kill a poor woman and boy 
This boy will make you wail. You and your daughter in the house, though he be three times bastard. For just as stony ground often overtops deep soil in its produce, so many bastards are better men than legitimate sons. But take your daughter away, for it is better for mortals to have a kinsman who is poor and honest than one who is rich and base. And you are a nullity. From trivial causes the tongue causes great quarrel for mankind. Mortals who are wise take care not to start a quarrel with those near and dear to them. How can you maintain that old men are wise when you, Peleus, son of a famous father and connected by marriage with the man who was once renowned among Greeks for wisdom, utter words that are disgraceful to yourself and reproachful to me on account of this barbarian woman here? You ought to be driving her off beyond the now waters or beyond the faces and asking for my help at it too. Since she is from Asia, where great numbers of Greeks fell before the spear and she shares in the death of your son Achilles. For Paris who slew your son Achilles was Hector's brother and she was Hector's wife. Yet you share the same roof with her. You think it right to have her at your table and you allow her to give birth in your house to children who are your bitterest, and bitter, bitterest enemies. And when I, in forethought for you and for me, meant to kill her, I find she is snatched from my hands. It come now. It is no shame to touch on this point. If my daughter has no children and a drama key does, Will you set them up as kings over the land of Phythia? Or will they, though barbarian in race, rule over Greeks? After that, you can maintain that I, who hate what I what is not right, am lacking in judgment, while it is you that have sense. <laughs> Consider now this point too. If you have given your daughter to one of your fellow citizens and she had suffered this kind of treatment, would you sit by in silence? I do not think so. Yet you do, on behalf of a foreigner, shout such things at your close kin? Further, a woman groans as much as a man when she is wronged by her mate. So to a man, so to a man groans when he has a wayward wife in his house. The man's strength lies in his hands, while the woman's interests are defined by her parents and kin. Am I not right then to come into aid to my own? You are an old, old man. And when you mention my generalship, you help my case more than you would have by silence. Helen got into trouble, not of her own accord, but by the will of the gods. And this was a very great service to Hellas. For the Greeks who were ignorant of weapons and battle made progress in learning marital courage and association is the teacher of all things to mortals. And if I forbore, when I came face to face with my wife to kill her, that was self-control. I wish you had not killed Focus either. This attack on you, I have made in goodwill towards you, not out of anger. But if you show a hot temper, you merely increase your prattling, whereas my prudent foresight is gained to me. Cease from these foolish words, both of you. This is by far the best course, lest the two of you fall together. Oh, how perverse customs are in Greece. When the army routs the enemy, they do not regard this as the deed of those who have done the work, but rather the general receives the honor. He brandished his spear as one man among countless others and did no more than a single warrior, yet he gets more credit. And sitting high and mighty in office in the city, they think grander thoughts than the commons, though they are worthless. The people are far superior to them in wisdom if they acquired at once daring and will. It is in this fashion that you and your brother sit puffed up over Troy, 
and your generalship there made high and mighty by the toils and labours of others. But I will teach you not to regard Paris, shepherd of Mount Ida, a greater enemy to you than Peleus, unless you clear off from this house at once, you and your childless daughter. This child, offspring of my loins, shall drive her through this house, grasping her by the hair, if she, sterile heifer that she is, does not put up with others having children, just because she herself has none. If her luck in respect to children is bad, must we be bereft of offspring? Clear away from this woman's slaves, so that I may learn whether anyone means to prevent me from loosening her hands. Raise yourself up. Though I tremble with age, I will loosen the plaited thongs. Did you, base coward, mar her hands thus? Was it a bull or a lion you thought you were tying up with the noose? Or were you afraid she might take a sword and wreak vengeance on you? Come here under my arm, child. Help me to untie your mother's bonds. In Pythia, I shall bring you to manhood to be a great enemy to these people. If you Spartans did not have your reputation won by spear fighting, you may be sure that in other respects you are no one superior. Old men are a thing that knows no restraint and are hard to keep a watch on because of their quick temper. You fly too readily into abuse of talk. For my part, since I have come to Phthia against my will, I shall not do anything demeaning, nor will I have it done to me. For the present, since I do not have unlimited time, I will go home. There is a city not far off from Sparta, which previously was friendly, but now is hostile. I mean to attack it as general and make it our subject. But when I've arranged matters there to my satisfaction, I shall return. Man to man with my son-in-law, I shall instruct and be instructed. And if he pushes, if, and if he punishes her, and in future shows moderation towards us, he shall receive moderation and return. But if he is angry, anger shall be his reward. And he shall get deeds successive to his deeds. <laughs> but as for your words, I bear with them patience. For like a shadow that walks, you have a voice, but are powerless to do anything but speak. So as a <laughs> contrast with the scene that came before, um, that scene is pretty powerful. It takes us to two famous heroes, well, the father of a famous hero and a famous king arguing over one another, and then one just sort of abdicating all responsibility and leaving. Uh, there's a strange theme in this play of sort of the absence of men and the, their ineffectiveness. Um, and there's so much, there's such a deep scene, there's so much going on. And Katerina, what did you see there? And what are some things um, that you took away from that performance? Um, what I like to begin with uh, is that when uh, uh, Peleus arrives, uh, he argues with Menelaus uh, over who has the greatest claim uh, uh, and control over Andromache. And the word he uses is kurios, which we both know is a very, is, is a loaded term, is actually a legal term uh, in, in classical Athens. So who's in charge of the oikos, who's in charge of the women of the oikos uh, is the question here. Uh, and of course, um, uh, Euripides, I think, is, is problematizing the whole idea of um, you know, being in, char in charge of the oikos. Uh, he, he's problematizing uh, this very deeply uh, patriarchal society uh, that uh, classical Athens was. Um, so uh, th this is one thing. Uh, the other is that the uh, Peleus uh, has a rhetoric 
um, of, um, and of course we have to remember that Peleus is of course not from Athens, right? He's not an Athenian king, uh, but uh, he kind of voices uh, the whole Athenian disapproval uh, of the um, uh, legendary freedom uh, of Spartan women. And the, the freedom uh, of the educational system uh, of, of, that uh, Spartan women seem uh, to have enjoyed, that Spartan uh, education um, uh, was uh, in a way more free um, uh, than, than the Athenian one. Um, so th there's a lot of uh, moralizing there as well. But I think the most important thing that we might take out of Peleus' speech is that how th that he stresses uh, uh, that inborn uh, excellence um, might not be um, the most important thing. Uh, like uh, that uh, maybe uh, the son of Andromache might uh, as well as some um, legitimate child uh, be uh, the, the heir to the throne. And this is, uh, this is a wild claim. Yeah. Well, uh, an illegitimate so son uh, of, of a concubine, of a slave, um, is not supposed to be a legitimate. And I think Katerina froze there for a minute, so maybe she'll come back. I might have interrupted her and, and, and broken Zoom. Um, so I, I think just to move on, we'll move on to the next scene, but I think it's fascinating what Katrina there was saying um, about some of the uh, gender dynamics in this performance um, and how, it, you know, Euripides criticizes the, or has the, the men criticize the women pretty aggressively, but then the men really abdicate their responsibility and disappear. And one of the ways in which this is most clear in the play is by the absence of Neoptolemus. Right? And the women are constantly waiting for men to come and solve the problems. Uh, Peleus fails to do so. Menelaus fails to do so. And we're left with these powerful performances by women who are really uh, trapped in place. So after um, the last scene where Menelaus and Peleus were on the stage with Andromache, um, they leave the stage and the chorus sings of the problems of justice. And then Hermione's nurse enters the stage. We find out that Hermione tried to hang herself and was prevented by her servants. Hermione enters the stage and laments the deaths she pursued. Um, so she changed her mind um, and then the chorus tries to talk some sense into her. And just at this moment of despair when um, Hermione is wishing she had pursued a completely different course of action, Orestes, the son of Agamemnon, arrives on stage. And that'll be the next scene. Oh, son of Agamemnon, appearing like a haven from storm to sailors, I beg you by your knees, have pity on me for the ill luck you see me suffering. For my fortunes are not good. I place about your knees my arms, which have the force of suppliant garlands. <laughs> What is this? Do I make some mistake or, or do I truly see this house's lady, Menelaus's daughter? Yes, the only one, Helen, daughter of Tyrandarus, bore to my father in their home, you may be quite sure. Oh, Phoebus, healer God, give us a resolution of these troubles. What is the matter? Is it from gods or mortals that you are being ill-treated. In part I am to blame, in part my husband, and in part one of the gods. I am wholly undone. What other misfortune could there be to a woman who was not yet born children than one affecting her marriage bed? The very point of my grief. You lead me well. Your husband loves another in your stead. Yes, Hector's bride, the spear one captive girl. Your words spell bane. One man who has two women. That is how things stand. And then I took revenge. Did you 
plot against her such things as women contrive. Yes, death for her and for her bastard son. Did you kill them? Or did some mischance prevent you? Old Peleus stopped me, honouring the lowly. And was there one who shared this murder with you? My father, come from Sparta for this purpose. Yet he was bested by an old man's hand. Yes, by his sense of shame. And then he left me. I see. For what you've done, you fear your husband. Yes, for he will be within his rights to kill me. What use to speak of it? But I entreat you in the name of Zeus, who is of our family. Escort me to any place far away from this land or to my father's house. For this house seems to take voice and drive me forth and the land of Pythia hates me. And if my husband leaves the Oracle of Phoebus and comes home before then, he will kill me in great disgrace or I shall be a slave to the concubine who was once my slave. How then did you come to commit these grave sins, as some might call them? My undoing was bad women coming into the house. They puffed me up in folly by speaking in this vein. Will you put up with this wretched captive in your house, sharing your marriage bed? By the goddess, in my house she would not have taken her pleasure of my husband and lived looking on the light. I listened to these sirens' words, these clever, knavish, deceitful chatterers, and became inflated with foolish thoughts. What necessity was there to keep such a watch on my husband when I had all I needed? I had great wealth, I was mistress in the house, and I would have borne legitimate children while she would have borne Bastards with half-slave parentage to serve my children. But never, never, for I will say it more than once, ought sensible men who have wives to allow women to come to visit their wives in the house. They are the ones who teach evil. One corrupts her marriage with an eye to gain, while another, who has slipped from virtue, wishes for company in her vice, while others act from mere lewdness. That is the source of disease in the houses of men. In view of this guard, well with bolt and bar the gates of your houses. The visits of women from outside are the cause of nothing that is sound, but of much trouble. So Hermione in that scene presents a pretty strong condemnation of women. And it's interesting to think about um, what ancient audiences might have thought, right? especially in um, conjunction with what she said before. And then the, the play continues to move quite quickly. So Orestes appearing in the play is a bit of a surprise. And he listens to the story. And she continues to make him uh, to become his suppliant. Uh, and he says that he came to free her from this house. So it's not an accident that Orestes is there. He did, just didn't happen to show up on that day. He came to free her from this house because he was supposed to marry her to begin with. He has already laid a trap for Neoptolemus and the, then the chorus returns, singing of the plague of war that struck Greece and Troy in turn and Peleus arrives again. He's cued in that Hermione has left for somewhere else. And as he's absorbing that knowledge, a messenger arrives to announce the death of Neoptolemus at Delphi. Orestes convinces everyone that he was there to plunder Apollo's temple, and he fell defending himself against many. And that's when we get to the final scene of the play. See, here is our Lord, his body carried home from the land of Delphi. Luckless is the murdered man, luckless likewise, old sir, are you. For not as you hoped do you now receive Achilles' son home, and you yourself have come to the same fate as the wicked suffer. Me, what disaster is this I see, and take in my hands into my house? Oh, alas, city of Thessaly, I am undone. 
I am perished. None of my race, no children are left for me in my house. Oh, how wretched misfortune has made me. To what friend shall I look for consolation? Oh, face that I love, and knees, and hands. Would that the god had killed you beneath Troy's walls by the bank of the Simois. Yes, for in that case he would have been honoured in death, and your life would be more fortunate. Oh, marriage, marriage, you have destroyed my house, my city. Alas, my child. Would that my grandson had not cast upon his children and his house the burden of ill-famed marriage to Hermione, a marriage that was death to you, my son. Rather, he should have perished ere then by the lightning bolt. And how I wish that he had never, mortal that he is, fastened upon Phoebus the god because of his archery, the death of his Zeus-descended father. Oh, grief. I shall begin my lament for my perished lord with the strain reserved for the dead. Oh, grief. In succession to you, I, unhappy man, old and luckless, take up the lament. A god's was this doom. A god made this disaster. You have left the house bereaved, dear child. Oh, alas, unhappy me and robbed an old man of his children. Death, death before your children die, this would have been right. Shall I not rend my hair, not strike upon my head a hand's blow to end all? O oh, my city, of two sons has Phoebus bereft me. O oh, unlucky old man, who have seen and suffered pain, what life will be yours for time to come? Childless and bereft, with no limit set to misfortune, I shall drain unhappiness to the dregs until my death. It was for nothing that the gods blessed you in marriage. All that blessedness is flown, sped beyond the reach of high-flying boasts. Lonely in a lonely house you dwell. Oh, city, I am dead. Farewell, my scepter, and you, Nereid, in your dark cave, shall see me fallen into utter destruction. Ah, what is this motion? What divine being do I see? Look, women, see! Here is a god who wings her way through the bright air and treads the ground of horse-pasturing Phythia. Helios, because of the marriage bed we once shared, I, Theatus, have left the house of Nereus and come here. First, I counsel you ought not be much cast down by your present misfortunes. For even I, who ought not to have borne children to make me weep, since I am a goddess and have a god for my father, have lost the child I had from you, Achilles. Swift of foot, whom I bore to be the noblest of Greeks. But listen, and I shall tell you why I have come. Take the son of Achilles, who lies here slain, to the altar of Delphi, and there bury him. A reproach to the Delphian, so that its grave may proclaim that he was violently slain by the hand of Orestes. As for the captive woman, I mean Adromache. She must go to dwell in the land of Molossia and be married to Helenus. And her must go with her son, the last of the line of Aeacus. It is fated that his descendants in unbroken succession will rule over Molossia and live their lives in prosperity. For old sir, it was not to be that your race and mine should be so laid waste nor that of Troy, for Troy too is in the gods' care, although it fell by the will of Pallas Athena. As for yourself, in order that you may feel gratitude for your marriage to me, 
I shall set you free from mortal woe and make you a god, deathless and exempt from decay. And then you shall dwell with me in the house of Nereus, god with goddess for all time to come. From there, walking dry shout out of the deep, you will see your beloved son and mine, Achilles, dwelling in his island home on the strand of Luke and the sea inhospitable. But go to the God-built city of Delphi with the body of this man, and when you have buried him in earth, go follow the hollow cave to the ancient promontory in Sepius and sit. Wait there until I come from the sea with a chorus of 50 nereids to escort you. You must carry out the course that fate prescribes for this is the will of Zeus. Cease your grieving for the dead for this is the judgment that stands over all mortals and death is their debt to pay. O oh, lady, O oh, noble bedfellow, daughter of Nereus, farewell. Your deeds are worthy of yourself and of the children sprung from you. I shall put an end to grief at your command, goddess. And when I have buried this man, I shall go to the glens of Pelion, where I took your fair form in my arms. How then should a man not take a wife from a noble family and give his daughter in marriage to the great and good if he has sense? Should he not avoid desiring an ignoble wife even if she brings a rich dowry to the house? Never shall they fare ill at the hands of the gods. So this play in the typical Euripidean style moves from character to character, subject to subject, and ends with Peleus uh, getting immortality. Um, so I'm hoping Katerina can log back in so we can talk about um, what's going on here. Um, the, and the actors all should turn off uh, on their videos so we can speak, um, because there's a lot in this play um, that I don't fully understand. Uh, which is typical, that's uh, where I start out every week. Um, but one of the things that amazes me about this play is how much of its action um, comes in the movement um, from one character to another rather than actually the plot, right? So in other Euripides plays like Orestes, um, you get movements of violence. We're gonna move this, murder this person. We're gonna murder that person. But in this play, um, it is interestingly sort of a, a um, emotional expo exploration of different characters. So while we're waiting um, for Katerina to come back, uh, I'm wondering if we could start with some of the actors. Let's see, uh, where do we wanna start this week? Let's start with Brian. Brian, Menelaus. Um, so I think it's fair to say Menelaus has issues, right? Um, just generally, he's got issues. Uh, what do you, what, when you come on stage to project those issues, um, what are the main features of his suffering or his, of his worldview um, that you had in mind? And you're still muted, uh, Brian. Okay, now, now I'm now I'm here. Um, wow, geez, that's loaded. Um, I felt like <laughs> um, what I was thinking. Um, I I think when I first came on on stage and just was di dissecting him, I was thinking like, I think he feels that he's right, and I feel like he thinks that he is doing the right thing. I think he feels justified and reclaiming this space, so to speak. I, I really, I, I love that response. I, I don't know if you watched last week uh, or maybe it was <laughs> before, but several of the actors have, um, have shown themselves to be better readers of characters than I ever am because they express, hey, look, you need to try to at least be on your character's side. Right. And Menelaus to exist in the world as a Menelaus needs to believe that he's right and he does weird things. Um, and that, I mean, the engagement between Peleus and Menelaus, the argument they have about basically who's the lamest dude, 
it, it's fascinating. So, so Peleus, Michael, when you were going into this, how much had you thought about the myth beforehand? And, and versus how much were you just sort of sliding into this sort of, uh, uh, let's say, ancient cockfight? Uh, um, the, the first thing I would say is just that it's it just reads so well, doesn't it? it? It's it is it doesn't feel like you're reading anything that's not contemporary. It feels the 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 the, um, the rawness of the emotion, the rawness of the feelings these guys are feeling about one another um, is is surpri really surprising to me. Um, and so I guess that, it, 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 as you said, an actor will always sort of defend his character. It's it's not defending the character. It's that you you um, allow um, the, the the character's feelings to hopefully to to become your own. And it what um, what is just so good about this is that you're instantly drawn into um, well. Uh, conflict the 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 attitudes are so clear <laughs> as you said you know these two guys are slugging it out their attitudes to one another are, are, are really um just pouring out of each other uh, pouring out of their mouths and that's um that's great fun to play one of the things you both brought out in it um, that, you know, it's really interesting since you're far apart, I don't know if you know each other, um, is the familiarity, right? So what I really got from this is something maybe you've all seen in families, if not your own others, um, which are two older people who've hated each other for years, but had to deal with each other's nonsense because of a marriage, right? And they're just both like, well, we're done. Right, this is over and just I mean you really get you, you sort of get to contemplate different topics and one of those topics is sort of the relationship between men and women right one of the reasons why this play has so much purchase is it looks at that central part of sort of a human society which is marriage um, and how it goes wrong so terribly um, Tamika I mean one of the things that I mean again another great performance um, and the choices you make like I mean do you at times your Andromache is raw, but she also retains that core of nobility um, that makes her such a powerful character. Um, what were you seeing as sort of the chief challenges of taking on this role this week? Challenges? <laughs> yeah. um, I think showing the restraint of not wanting to hurt this little girl for blaming me for things that I that I'm at no fault at, at doing I'm forced into this situation and you're blaming me it's like hurt people hurt people and so it's it's it was maintaining that the the virtuosity of Andromache and not letting Hermione see the, the, the pain or not allowing Hermione to see that, um, that basically she's pissing her off and you need to just leave me alone. Yeah. And then, I mean, cause I was reading this, I think the first time we read this was a few weeks ago, um, over a month ago now I've reviewed it again. And I, I just can't imagine the pain and suffering a character like Andromache goes through, right? Oh yeah. And and the just I don't know what's in Euripides' head to put her on stage again with another child about to be killed. Right? I mean, I can't even imagine the audience reaction to that because everybody knows. I mean, it's sort of classic Euripides, like you know about this child being killed. Oh wait, here's another. Um, right. And it, it's just it, it, it's harrowing. You know, and I think, I can, yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine what it's like to lose a child and being a mother myself, the thought of, even the thought of that possibility um, is still painful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I can't imagine contemplating it. And what, what I try to do to sort of level off the emotion, say, well, in the ancient world, you know, infant mortality was above 40%. Um, but I just don't think that that's enough to explain it, right? I don't think Euripides is callous. I think he's going for a gut punch here, 
you know, mm -hmm. and and where where that where I get really confused about this play is sort of the journey of the presentation of sort of women that goes between the characters of Andromache and Hermione, right? So at Evie, like your Hermione was like sweetly evil, right? Um, but at the end, like when she when she really reflects on her status as a wife being very little uh, different from Andromache's status. Um, it sort of turns the page until Orestes shows up and she runs off with him. Um, so what was it like to navigate those typically Euripidean um, waves of emotion and focus? Yeah, interesting. I mean, fun, like great fun. Um, I think I think this felt to me uh, when I first read it like a like a really amazing example of people who were oppressed turning in on each other. Um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie has that amazing uh, or line or kind of thought in, in um, We Should All Be Feminists about the fact that we raise women as competitors to each other for the attention of men. And it feels like this, in this play and you know, in that time, the, the terrifying positions that every woman finds themselves in, how like totally precarious it is based on their ability to marry and to bear leg legitimate heirs, you know? So I feel like, yeah, I suppose as an actor, you're always looking for where it comes from. Hermione's not just evil and looking to kill someone. There's obviously something that's driving that. Um, and I think maybe that for me, finding that motivation um, then meant that it, it felt like a kind of clear through line really. Um, because what she's feared most has come to pass. She's lost, she's, she's lost her position. And I think that reading of sort of Euripides understanding what we now call internalized oppression <laughs> really makes him a much more powerful playwright, right? Than ancient ones. As we've talked about before, ancient um, critics maligned him as being misogynist, right? Um, and there's a great anecdote um, that's probably not true where Sophocles is talking about the difference between his characters and Euripides. And Sophocles says, well, my characters are the way people should be. And Euripides write, he writes people the way they are. And I think what happens on the stage is that women get fleshed out in the many terms of the word in a way that only men do in other plays. And they get the fullness of character and the fullness of their lives is pretty constrained, right? Unless, of course, you get to be a goddess like Nori did this week. Nori, <laughs> um, you got to be the Dea Ex Machina and just sweep in at the end and fix everything. Um, what was that like? And what was this experience like? Because this is your first week here. It was my first week here. It, it you know, it, it was emotional looking at this play and drawing parallels to what's going on in society today and really um, trying to be a voice of justice and a voice of levity and a voice of um, reason among warring people, among warring uh, emotions and uh, warring ideologies. And for me, I first had to find the love. Uh, take, I, I first took myself down from a goddess and found the primal love for humanity, the primal love for this man, the primal love for um, Achilles and knowing that he doesn't have the luxury to see things in the afterlife, to see things as they could be, as they may be, and still empathizing with his mourning but at the same time, as, as a, a goddess telling him he's got to get it together, got to get it together and, and has to move on, it was a joy for me personally to, to be able to free someone, especially in the climate that, that we're in today. It just felt cathartic. And maybe that's a, a selfish um, luxury <laughs> that I, I drew from this production. But... It was um, it was really emotional to be able to to pull someone out of their grief, to pull someone out of their enslavement, to pull um, a child out out of the the uh, threat of death and send them to go live prosperous 
when I look around the world at, at the plights of different people, I wish I could do the same. I, it's, it was, it hit home. I, I really appreciate what you're saying about the end giving you hope. Um, and I don't, and, you know, a few weeks ago, I can't remember which discussion it was. We we're talking about another Euripidean play, which I said was ridiculous. And one of our experts said, no, actually it is ridiculous, but at the end it actually does give the Athenians hope that despite their darkest hour, maybe something will happen. So I always find myself conflicted when the gods save at the end, um, because I'm like, well, if we keep waiting for a God to come down and save us, we're going to be screwed. Right. Um, but that may, may be my particular view of the world. You know what? And, and, uh, you know, I, as a person, I agree with that. I believe we have to take action on the plane that we're on. So I saw, um, um, Theotis as more of a social justice warrior than a goddess in this respect that, you know, um, those are the, the, po the dotted lines that I drew to myself that if I could do something, if Nori in the flesh could do something, I would, Aside from making the, the, the people gods, it's, <laughs> yeah, I would I would send people to live in prosperity and take people out of their mourning. It's um, a very human thing to want to do, I think. And, then, and on top of that, it, it's sort of, there's the Euripidean game of giving Thetis a happy ending and power at the end, because in the Iliad, all she gets to do is mourn a dead son, right? And I thank you, Nori, for bringing up, I mean, this play engages with so many things that are current now. Right from um, you know from the past few years of Me Too and really thinking about misogyny and sexual assault um, to the real strict dynamics here when it comes to enslavement and racism. There aren't many texts in the ancient world that specifically talk about the offspring of essentially raped enslaved women um, and uh, free people and what happens to them. Right, but you can see in the structure of this play and the expectations. Um, some of the framework that we receive in Europe and the United States that allows us to engage in the most wild, wide scale um, uh, slavery trade ever. And so it's really, it's frightening to see how this is connected so much intellectually and emotionally, emotionally to our own um, sort of cultural inheritance. Um, uh, so one of the things about this play that's really complicated are sort of the ebbs and flows in discussing sort of the powers and the restraints on women. Um, how do you put this play in sort of the Euripidean canon as far as his views on women and exploration of their agency? You know, I think it's, <laughs> maybe women, a lot of women may not want to hear this, but I think it's, it's very realistic. It's very current. Um, and I, I Listen, aside from it being out in the open, it's the same dynamics that go on today if a man takes on a mistress and has an illegitimate child and um, there are all kinds of YouTube fights. Now we have them on camera of what happens between <laughs> when one woman finds you know out about the other. And, you know, we're still having these battles on social media today about what makes, what is respectability? What does being a woman mean? What is, what are gender roles now? And what is feminism? And I feel that these two women are, are pitted against each other in a system that's, that's set up for them to fail. But at the same time, I think they should try to understand each other in the way that uh, the reasoning that, that, um, <laughs> was was trying i do believe you shouldn't upset your household a lot of women aren't going to like the fact that i say i do i really do believe that there is something to a woman being peace in a household you can't create hell for her to try to to, to <laughs> make that happen but there's something to that and <laughs> To take that theme back to so the play in, in general, um, Katerina, to build off Nori, Nori's language, um, you talked a lot about sort of relationships between the oikos, the household, and the city, polis, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the city and the household are often metaphors that reflect each other. How does that work in this play? And how does it sort of reflect its context of what's going on during the Peloponnesian War? 
Well, I'd like to comment a little bit on what Norris said earlier. Uh, and uh, you probably know that that's uh, a lot of times students ask, so is Euripides a feminist? Is Euripides a misogynist? Uh, and it's always a fun question to ask, of course. But I think it's better to, um, uh, it, it, instead of trying to find uh, whether Euripides is a feminist or not, uh, to try to understand what uh, questions Euripides is trying to ask uh, here, and uh, what's the historical context of uh, Euripides' handling of female characters? And that is, uh, that's an important question uh, to ask. Uh, another thing I really like in this play is that the, um, uh, the protagonists are not feminists uh, or, or misogynists. So for example, uh, we really like Andromache for, for uh, and, and when, and, um, uh, uh, we, she, uh, Euripides uses all this foreignness, um, uh, uh, her isolation, uh, the vulnerability of, of the heroine, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, at some point, she is really reflecting this whole uh, internalized misogynistic view that we don't really like. Uh, and this is this is really uh, surprising, uh, but on the other hand, it's very important to to uh, to see that those characters are not black and white, uh, and sometimes they just uh, can uh, they, they do what they can, uh, and a lot of times we do what we can uh, in, in the society we're living, right? <laughs> well, uh, I really like that you bring up that the characters aren't, you know, simply one thing or another, um, because that's really mm -hmm. what sets Euripides apart is that he invites interpretation, right? He doesn't right. make it easy. And, uh, you know, a strict, like, conservative misogynist could see right. them in one way, um, and someone with a more liberal point of view could definitely read them in another. Um, mm -hmm. And so to say, what does Euripides think? Well, that's not important. Right, 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 right. right. Like, what do we um, think? And why would he set it up that way? Um, mm -hmm. so we, we are moving towards sort of the end of our time today. So I want to make sure we get everybody involved. Sarah, uh, my fellow New Englander, uh, this was your first time working with us. Can you tell me what it is like being the chorus and any reflections you have on the play? Sure. Yeah, thank you. This was a lot of fun. It was really great to hear something out loud and participate. I mean, the chorus echoing and uh, I thought it was I thought it was interesting that the first chorus line was a bit catty sort of like oh there goes a woman making upset with other women um but then throughout the chorus and um I'd be curious to go back and read um read more of the chorus's laments throughout and sort of the explanations throughout but um echoing and and um then being on Andromache's side to say you know why don't you listen to her? Is there anything, you know, trying to, between the women, be be the voice of reason and then showing up and being, trying to be the voice of reason between the men, you know, warning them. But I also think it's funny when the chorus comes in with little jabs, like, you know, old men can't be controlled because of their temper. Um, but then at times being able to, to do what is needed in the moment, a voice of reason, a voice of the, the voice of the community, the voice of empathy when, when um, Peleus is in mourning. Um, so it's fun. I like, I like the chorus parts. Um, and, and Euripides' choruses move so much all over the place that it's really hard to pin them down and sort of characterize what they're doing. Um, so yeah, if I were to pick a a core a course to work with it would be one of his um, and this play in particular um, Emma I'm now going to direct the question towards you so I was going through this play and you know I like to excerpt things and quote them and put them on Twitter um, and if I could I'd quote most of this play like this this is play is just chock full of quotable lines and passages you just want to study I don't know why that is but how did you go about cutting it down to these selections um, because it's filled with I mean it's just filled with good stuff yeah, this one, this one was not easy to cut. And for those exact same reasons, I was, there were portions that I was genuinely very sad to lose, um, particularly the confrontation on the altar with Menelaus, um, which is just so evocative, like physically evocative. And that was the one section where I thought maybe 
having that be something that isn't necessarily staged and having that be something that is purely spoken, it loses a little bit of the power when we don't actually have Andromache on the altar. And I wanted to keep a little bit of Orestes and Hermione because much as I love centering this narrative on Andromache, I do want to keep as much of Hermione in as I can because as Nori and Tamika and Evie have all highlighted, this play is about what happens in systems of oppression when women are pitted against each other rather than being pitted against anyone that they, that they should actually be fighting back against. And even Hermione in her role as aggressor and her role as antagonist still needs her say and still needs her angle. Um, so I definitely wanted to keep her and Orestes in, especially just because that moment with Orestes is so utterly out of left field. Um, yeah. and, and we didn't get to talk much about mythography there, but Orestes getting her in the end is, 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 a, is a very you know, surprising ending. Um, and, and that scene between Hermione and Andromache is so fascinating um, and so well played by Evie and Tamika today. So thank you again um, to everybody. And Emma, and Emma you, you picked some good scenes. Uh, you, you did a good job with it. Um, so Paul, uh, next week, um, I've already lost track of what we're gonna do for next week. Um, next week, we're going to be moving to a comedy. That is right, yeah. It's, it's almost as though we've now taken as much tragedy as we can. <laughs> and we, we're we gonna, at last- don't, um, say, don't say that, Paul, because suddenly there'll be an asteroid or something. Like just- <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm, I'm inviting trouble now, um, but it's okay. I've got, you know, there are gods and goddesses to come down and save us. Um, so yeah, so we, we're going to take a week out of tragedy um, to explore some, the world of Greek comedy next week. So we're going to be doing the Aristophanes Clouds and we're going to be working with Beth Burns, who's a fantastic director based down in Austin, Texas. So that's a really exciting um, sort of new phase of the project. We're now, this is now our 15th um, tragedy that we've covered. Um, we've still got quite a few more to go and um, we're heading on until Christmas um, and who knows what happens after that. Um, and in the coming weeks as well, as well as looking at tragedy, we're going to do a few different things. We're going to be having one episode on the 29th of July that's going to be exploring t just the chorus because that's something that we've, we've not kind of played around with too much in terms of how we can use this medium to um, tackle the chorus and we want to kind of give some proper space to that and then in early August we are going to be doing a full um, a sort of a full online staged version um, of one of these tragedies as well and we'll be announcing more details about all of that um, very very shortly so just wanted to say um, you know a big thank you to everyone who watches and big thank you to all of the brilliant actors who have come on board. We've had about 30 actors already from um, all parts of the States and the UK, Greece, Mexico involved. And we're hoping to carry on building that and building that more and more and have uh, an international ensemble of brilliant performers working together with these brilliant academics as well to keep on exploring these plays. So just, just want to say a big thank you to everyone. Thank you for your energy, Paul, as always. It's impressive. Um, and so next week, then it'll be Aristophanes Clouds at three o'clock in the US, eight in the UK, and different times anywhere in between. As always, we have a whole team of people making this possible for us. Um, John Coyley keeps giving us amazing posters, and I can't get, I don't get enough of those. Um, thanks also to Lana, to Lana, sorry, Ali, Janet, Ellen, Sarah, Keith. Um, Greg for applauding us from the from the sidelines um, and everybody else who makes this possible. Um, we've now been doing this for oh, for 16 weeks. Um, at the beginning, we didn't know how long this is going to last. We're surging in the U.S., so we're just going to keep going um, through Christmas. And now Paul, I guess, has uh, plans for when we finished all the plays. Um, so next week, three o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And until then, stay safe. Thank you.